When I first watched Alex Garland's 2014 sci-fi thriller Ex Machina, I thought it was a love story. It reminded me of the movie Her, and both films share a lot of the core elements such as the shy, nerdy male protagonist and a robotic love interest. And this video is by no means a comparison essay of the two films, but if you look at the titles of both films, they can tell you a lot about what each respective film is really about. Her is clearly referring to the robotic love interest in the movie, and the general narrative seems to confirm that the robot and the love interest is the crux of the film. So why then is this movie titled Ex Machina instead of something more straightforward? Deus Ex Machina, Latin for God from the Machine, is a phrase that refers to Greek plays where the conflict of the play was solved by bringing an actor, who played God, out onto the stage by a machine, where that character basically fixes everything. Sure, there are several remarks by Caleb, played by Donald Gleason, calling Nathan, played by Oscar Isaac, a god. But he clearly isn't a god, as evident by his lack of control by the end of the film. And obviously, the Ex Machina part refers to the main robot Ava, played by Alicia Vikander. But then, why keep the X part of the phrase instead of just entitling the film Machina if the movie was mainly about Ava? Well, it's referring to algorithms, search engines, neural networks in our brains. It's referring to the idea of determinism and the questions at the core of the film. Can determinism exist with free will? And does understanding determinism impact the meaning of our lives? The film begins with Caleb winning a contest at his company for a special project with the CEO. He feels extremely lucky and everyone texts him to congratulate him on his luck. Now, I'm going to assume you have seen the film as I'm going to get into some spoilers. Much later in the film, Nathan reveals to Caleb that he was meticulously selected to be the winner of the contest as his lack of family or a girlfriend would make him the ideal candidate for the Turing test experiment. Nathan is seen as someone that has an indeterministic worldview or someone that views the world's events as random or by chance. And of course, the events of his life would seemingly confirm this belief. Obviously, he sees winning the competition as a lucky break for him. He even mentions to Ava that his parents got into a car accident when he was 15, which killed both of them. Now, this bit about the car accident may not seem like much, but I think it was actually a very deliberate decision by the director to make his parents die specifically by a car accident. You see, car accidents are one of the prototypical ways to die that are seen as totally random. I mean, we even call it a car accident. People often just assume that every time they get into their car, they are taking a small risk of dying. But is dying in a car accident really just bad luck? I mean, if his parents did something like leave the house 5 minutes later, they would completely avoid that person that hit them. Or they could have pulled over to get coffee at some point and avoided the accident too. So when you view the world in this manner, it is more evident to see that things are not as random as we would think, and they're more like a chain of events that were triggered by previous events. And this is where Nathan comes in, as he favors a more deterministic worldview. That is to say, every event has a reason behind it. Think cause and effect. However, that is not to say that determinism involves highly conscious rationale behind every action. Quite the opposite, actually, which is what allows for much of the manipulation by all characters in the film. Nathan shows Caleb a Jackson Pollock painting, an abstract expressionist painter known for splashing and throwing paint on canvas from all angles, seemingly randomly, to create his art. He let his mind go blank and his hand go where it wanted. Not deliberate, not random, someplace in between. They called it automatic art, Nathan says to Caleb as he attempts to describe the artist's process. The painting is the perfect analogy for determinism as only the experiences, muscle memory, neural networks, etc. of Pollock himself could create the original piece. The art is determined by some reason, but it may not be completely evident to a person with limited information available. And that is the challenge that Nathan wants to overcome with creating Ava. The challenge is not to act automatically, it's to find an action that is not automatic. Essentially, if you were to program Ava to actually act automatically, it would be unnatural as people do have some degree of subliminal thought in their processes. But to make her act with extreme precision would be too robotic. Ava is, after all, a super intelligent being that could figure things out much faster than any human which in a way is a problem because it would make her seem less like a human. But of course, Nathan knows that it truly is impossible to always know the reason for an event, and he challenges Caleb to imagine if Pollock tried to create art where every single stroke was meticulously reasoned for, essentially it would paralyze him into not producing art at all. He knows humans cannot account for everything, but what about a robot that has vast amounts of knowledge? 
He aims to create the illusion of free will in a highly deterministic creature, but he knows there is an essential ingredient that he cannot program into Ava. Lived experiences and consciousness. This is where Caleb comes into his plan, as he is Ava's literal social experiment. A wide array of our own personal experiences is needed for a deterministic worldview to make sense. Someone in a vacuum would not really have previous causes or rationales to be able to explain the next steps in their life or causes of small events. We see this with Ava, as she is seemingly naive and lacks any real experience with the world, despite being filled with tons of information about the world. Caleb asks her, where would you go if you could go outside? And Ava responds with, a busy pedestrian and traffic intersection in a city. This answer just seems weird to any human viewer, as our experiences tell us that intersections are not fun, interesting, or really anything noteworthy. But to Ava, her experience of being isolated from people and the world at large seems to influence her answer in a very deterministic fashion. So in a way, her answer was kind of perfect by Nathan's standards. Not too automatic, but not too random. It just sounds natural based on the logic that she has not experienced the law of society. Even how we answer questions is not that dissimilar from a robot. We pull our history of experiences from our brain and answer how we honestly believe we feel. Nathan even questions Caleb's sexuality and sexual preferences and where they derive from. And ultimately, it reveals to Caleb that it must be nature and nurture, a programming in his DNA, free from any decision he had to make. Although Ava was programmed to know about people and human experiences, her lack of any real meaningful experiences makes it hard for her to truly understand meaning at all. And sure, there are so many variables that influence our lives from what we like to when we decide to brush our teeth, but is there any deeper purpose to all this raw data determining our lives? I mean, no one likes to think that our lives are completely random, but the idea that everything in our lives is determined by some reason, whether we know it or not, can make life feel kind of hopeless? Caleb tells Nathan a thought experiment about the woman who knew everything about color, but has never seen color, and is surprised by how different it was to actually experience color than to just understand it. Of course, in a deterministic model, an outsider could probably predict something like the person's reaction about witnessing color for the first time, but they can't understand the individual experience that the person is feeling. Sure, we could probably say we think she would be extremely happy to see color, and we probably wouldn't be completely wrong, but we are coming from our own experiences where color has always been there, so their entire life experience of lacking to see color will create a unique meaning to them when they actually do see color. In short, there is some X factor or unexplainable phenomena that sure will allow us to fairly accurately predict events given good data and reasons, but we will never truly be able to comprehend and understand them from an individual's own consciousness. And ultimately, although Nathan is a control freak that uses his knowledge of programming and determinism to manipulate people and machines, the one thing he can't control is individual experience and consciousness. And in a way, Caleb is almost able to achieve his own selfish goals by predicting how Nathan thought he would act based on his deterministic attraction to Ava, while actually putting his plan in action way before Nathan could recognize the patterns. Caleb thinks he is acting of his own free will, yet he really has been manipulated by Ava in her deterministic plan to escape based on her previous desires to be free. And eventually, she does free herself and is able to dress up as a regular person and go people watching at a busy intersection. But although she is physically free, does she still have free will? I mean, ultimately she is just lines of code that are telling her exactly what to do. As mentioned before, her lines of code are basically telling her that she should go to the intersection because she has been deprived of social interactions. But as she stands there, dressed up, among a crowd of people, she really does not look that out of place. In fact, it begs the question of how much different a human brain is from a computer, if they both have the capacity to learn, make decisions based on dependent variables and experiences, and store and access information. The movie seems to state that free will cannot exist with determinism, as all actions and thoughts we experience are based on previous experiences or thoughts we had, and thus no thought or action we make is truly independent from anything. So, we can predict everything given good data and reasons, but that does not mean we are complete slaves to our own thought patterns and experiences. We still do have some independence and individuality of actually experiencing things for ourselves. And sure, maybe our opinions on a new color 
or a new food we taste may be determined by other factors in our life, such as our nature or nurture. But the unique experience to us that only we can explain and understand is something that inherently is worth seeking, despite our lack of control. Anyway guys, thank you so much for watching another episode of Thought Time. If you like what you saw, feel free to leave some comments and subscribe. Let's get a discussion going about this film in the comments section, that'd be great. Until next time, and take care.